foundations of linear progress frameworks as articulated by St. Augustine and G.W.F. Hegel. It is a meditation on the material results of colonialism and settler colonialism, a constant state of apocalypse, ecological disruption, and communities' attempts to reorient themselves after imaginations were colonized and pasts and futures were destroyed. I argue that in parable, Earth Seed functions as an anti-colonial um, uh, Afrofuturist religious tech, uh, project, project or technology as it is made accessible to black people, low-income black people, and disenfranchised black people. Earth Seed, which is at the center of Butler's meditation on post-colonial futurisms and the limitations of linear progress, uh, linear progress grapples with the specter of capitalist settler colonial imaginings of time, space, and order. I argue, therefore, that Earthseed is a religious technology that helps us think about the relationship between the problem of time, religion, and colonialism. Literary scholar Maxine LaVon Montgomery notes that the image of the end of the world is present in the novels of authors whose orientation is not specifically Christian. In several interviews, Butler has levied criticism against Christianity and the black church, or in the church as a whole, as, a, as an institution, despite her black Baptist upbringing. Still, she contends that religion is fundamental to human societies. In looking forward to stars, in looking toward the stars, and away from a changing planet ravaged by the negative effects of industrialization, however, Earthseed must avoid the domination um, and manipulation of temporalities through the appropriation of space. Using the common approach among scholars to identify what parable can tell us about new forms of black religious thought and practice, um, I respond in this paper to Jana Brown's question regarding Earthsea's inherent preoccupation with time, and she questions what would happen if we if we were to loosen from if we loosened or if we were loosened from structurally and institutionally enforced forms of relation. What kind of change is God in parables in the parable novels? What kind of movement and in what kind of time? Like African mythologies and cosmologies. Earth Seed demonstrates that the reality of time stretches in every direction upon multiple planes. Because Western linear time and its religions have failed, Earth Seed therefore facilitates a new method of ensuring survival through transmitting a potential future among the stars, as it, is, as it embodies both Judeo-Christian conceptions of time as linear and pre-enlightenment understandings of time as cyclical held by African civilizations. I argue further that the parable of a sower which by nature of its title reaches back to an agrarian past, prefigures the survival of the community feature in parable through the spiritual underpinnings of, of an African ancestral past. Earthsea's understanding of time is ultimately recursive, whereby the past intermingles with the present while interweaving imaginings of the future. Butler presents Earthsea in my imagination as an alternate religion and possible way out of an existing temporality in a country compromised by its relationship to, col to coloniality, genocide, chattel slavery, and total ecological devastation. But how does, if at all, Butler resolve the problem or what I believe to be a central problem in parable, that is, a problem of time? Butler's texts seem to have two functions regarding time. On the one hand, Lauren Olamina, the, the novel's titular character, writes that the destiny of Earthsea is to take root among the stars. The teleological function of Earthsea is to therefore move linearly in time towards a future. Though the crumbling of Western civilization and the ecological decay of Earth compromises the notion of the linear progress narrative, Earthsea's teleology, which points towards a future, presupposes the notion of progress. Therefore, we must question whether Earthseed is folding linear progress back into its own story. On the other hand, parable borrows from a parable of Jesus found in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the astrocanonical Gospel of Thomas. In this parable, Jesus' use of agricultural imagery reflects the rural nature of Roman, of Roman Palestine, in which agriculture was the primary means of production. As K.C. Hansen and Douglas E. Oakman argue, the high incidence of agrarian motifs in Jesus' parables correspond with this. The Gospels are rich with allusions to crops and agricultural operations. Parables like the planted weeds or the parable of a sower in Matthew chapter 13, the mustard seed in Mark chapter 4, 
or harvest time in Mark chapter 4 indicate Jesus' careful observation of, observation of um, Galilean agriculture. According to Eliade, the archaic ontology of agrarian societies hinges upon the belief that time regenerates. Therefore, humans in archaic and, in archaic and traditional societies feel connected to the cosmos and cosmic rhythms. What work then does Butler's invocation of Jesus' parable of the sower do regarding, regarding the problem of time? Here it is helpful to situate Butler's writings within the tradition of speculative fiction and the tradition of, of speculative religion. I read Butler's interest in, in an astral future coupled with her appropriations of um, the parable of a sower in the biblical text in her novel's title as reaching back to what John Balecki refers to as a fractal or recursive past which allows her to think the future. Citing the Mormon Transhuman Association as an exemplar, Balecki argues that the, that the combination of Abrahamic astronomy and theosis suggests that a, past, that a past can be useful in building a future, but careful not to suggest that histories of colonial violence and white supremacy are ripe with positive possibilities. Balecki warns that when it comes to thinking through the true alterity of outer space, it cannot be any kind of past we recover to think about the future. It must be a recursive or fractal kind of past, where the past can also be a kind of future. Butler's synthesis of agrarian language from the New Testament with, with, with astrofuturism suggests something about the archaic ontology of agrarian societies that must be recovered should humans inhabit these extrasolar worlds. The coupling of the novel's title that captures an agrarian past alongside the contents of the, of the text that prophesy the end of the world suggests that, that the industrial and technological advancements of the modern world have failed to lead world, world towards progress um, but led to its decline. Lauren is therefore doing more than planting the seeds of a new religion in hopes that its good news will fall on fertile soil. Instead, Earthsea is a call to return to a mythical time where primitive societies and traditional civilizations adhere to the universe's natural cosmic rhythms and cycles. Doing so will aid those who ultimately take root among the stars in ensuring that they do not repeat the same environmental mistakes in another world as they did on Earth. Embedded in the idea of cosmic, of cosmic cycles and rhythms um, recognized by primitive societies and traditional civilizations is a belief in a periodic regeneration of time. According to Eliade again, this belief presupposes in more or less explicit form, and especially in historic civilizations, a new creation, that is, a repetition of a, cosmo of a cosmogonic act, such as a cyclical regeneration of time. Butler's choice to name this religion Earthsea is therefore not cavalier. The name of the religion, which hold, the name of the religion holds within it a reverence for creation and a state of being, uncompromised by imperfection, separation from the Creator, and colonial violence. Earthsea therefore not only looks toward the regeneration of time, of nature, man, and creation at large, but also anticipates the abolition of time. Butler's work is rightly classified as speculative, as speculative science fiction, Afrofuturist, all the above. Beyond the parables, her corpus at large is often omitted from the African-American apocalyptic fiction canon, although the, the, the thematic content of her novels fits the description. As Montgomery notes, African-American literary apocalyptic expression therefore reveals a concern with the end of an oppressive sociopolitical system and the establishment of a new world order where racial justice prevails. In Apocalypse, then, there is evidence of the crisis-ridden African-American experience such as the movement from country to city, the change from rural to agrarian, to an urban or industrialized environment. Beyond the fact that, parables, that, that Butler sets parable in a dystopian future, Butler's choice to juxtapose the agrarian language of the novel's title against the urban backdrop of the setting is what makes the story especially apocalyptic. It is crucial here to note that Butler's use of agrarian motifs alongside the setting of Parable, which is Robledo, California, a fictional town that is said to be 20 miles from Los Angeles. Uh, Pasadena, about 17 miles from LA, is where Octavia Butler grew up. Location is important then in understanding how both time and apocalypse in the fictional world of the parables and the actual world in which Butler was reared. California was the landing place for black Americans who fled Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. 
upon, in addition to Chicago and other places. Upon first glance, black Americans once confined to life on plantations in the American South, uh, imagine California with its mountains, sunny skies, and beaches, as you know, Alicia, you're from California, <laughs> to be a paradise. Black Americans move from one simple reality to another, but soon find that the same problems of race and class persist even in linear time. Both worlds, the fictional and the actual, Lawrence and Butler's, allow parable to be what Hugh and Louis Gates refers to as double-voiced. Butler is therefore providing a critical analysis of black American experience on two fronts. Although Butler derives the idea of the soul from, the, from an agrarian uh, period characterized by cyclical time, the seed of the sower suggests that you cannot escape linear time. Butler's choice to center religion and parable further allows the novel to function as an apocalyptic text in the biblical sense in both the Old and New Testament um, as they serve as a source of encouragement for oppressed Israelites facing religious political persecution under various imperial regimes. I'm closing now. <laughs> time in outer space is now governed uh, by, the, by what's called the master's clock, or is not governed by what's called the master's clock, which was crystallized through the, th through the discursive um, activism of settler, or activities rather, of settler colonialism, a practice that turns someone else's place into space and then place again. However, Lawrence aimed to use Earth Seed as a tool to facilitate extrasolar life, turns the onto-epistemological violence of settler colonialism on its head. As Giordano Nani notes in the colonialism of time, ritual, routine, and resistance of, in the British Empire, he writes, Europe, European territorial, territorial expansion has always been closely linked to and frequently propelled by the geographic extension of, of its clocks and its calendars. European colonists exploited African understandings of temporality to justify conquest. Uh, Denise Ferrer de Silva's assertion that the European subject depends on time illuminates the temporal aim of European colonists in civilizing Africans and Native Americans as well. To civilize the savage who exists outside of history and time is to bring them out of cyclical time or recursive uh, temporalities and into linear time through the adoption of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he aids the savage he being Jesus aids the savage in apprehending the concept of future time and more specifically eternity. The notion is seen in Hegel's lectures of philosophy on religion as he, where he suggests that African peoples or Negroes exist outside of history in an endless pre present and are therefore without a past and future. Earthseed, however, ultimately rejects the notion that savages only have a concept of the future through the scientific and religious colonial imagination. The final thing I'd like to bring our attention to um, is Lauren's condition as, an, as a hyper empath. From gunshot wounds to dog bites to sex, Lauren, due to, allegedly to her mother's drug abuse when she was pregnant with Lauren, has the ability to feel others' pain and pleasure at, a, at intense levels. If this panel calls us to think about the human as it is intertwined with issues of anthropogenic exploitation and degradation of the planet and complicated by relationships with non-humans, including animals and machines, how can we think about Lauren, a black and female, a black and female hyper-empath with, hyper with a Yoruba name alongside these constructions of the human or deconstructions? How can we trouble what bodies do? How can we trouble what black bodies do? I think it's interesting given the assumption made by slave, holster, slave holders scientists, modern gynecologists, and OBGYNs in Georgia, where I'm from, that black bodies, especially the, especially the black female body, does not feel pain. That Butler writes the main character as a black girl who feels pain. Lorna is not only a theorist of religion who thinks her way out of, death, out of the death spiral of modernity, but she feels, and her feelings of pain are often debilitating. Lest we forget that Lorna Olamina is a, a crack baby, uh, for lack of better words. Parable of a Sore was published in 1993, and Lauren is the negative effect of First Lady, Lady Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign and President Bill Clinton's impending crime bill that aimed to target First Lady, who First Lady Hillary Clinton referred to as super predators. Yet Lauren is the one who is called to end a world built on the logics of settler colonial violence. De Silva's toward a black feminist poetics, the question of blackness toward the end of the world, 
It's helpful to think with in considering how Lauren aims to facilitate a future beyond the limits of hegemonic Western space times and her hyper empathy. Earthsea as a, as a religious technology embodies the same ethical aim of what De Silva coins as black poetic intention. Instead of working towards the betterment of the world, it aims at the world's end. De Silva makes three, 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 three theoretical moves in the text, but I will only bring our attention to two, whereby she challenges the onto-epistemological grounds of the world as we know it. She says first, the subject and time, uh, she challenges how the subject and how time have been deployed to sustain, to sustain the subject and how the category of blackness, which already, car which already carries the necessary tools for dismantling, for dismantling the existing strategies of knowing. Lastly, De Silva speculates on a feminist poetics of blackness, where, which outlines a description of existence without the tools of universal reason which sustain the subject's grip on, on political imagination. I end with this question. Are we prepared then to think with and accept Butler's idea that a black girl who many of us would overlook on the street with a peculiar syndrome carries with her a subaltern way of knowing and being that not only challenges the anthrop anthropomorphic paradigm, hierarchy of life forms and biological assumptions about normative figurations of, figurations of the human, but it also, but it, but it's also the one who leads us into an alternate world colored with alternate temporalities, ethics, and imaginations of the category of religion. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Andrea Jane, and thanks for having me here. Um, this is my first time to be at this conference, and it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm a professor at, of religious studies at um, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI. It's the urban campus for IU, for those who aren't familiar with it. And um, I work generally on religion and capitalism. Um, and for anyone who's known what I've worked to up until the last couple of years, they think of me as the the yoga person because I uh, wrote on the yoga industry and popular spirituality and it, as a way of thinking about how we ought to theorize religion in the context of capitalism. But more recently, I really got tired of talking about yoga and I decided I'd, I've said everything I have to say about that. Um, and so I turned to, I, I continued this relig religion and capitalism thread, but um, turned to uh, other industries, industries that have been of interest to me for a very long time, um, industrialized animal agriculture in particular. And so this paper um, is coming out of those interests and also an ongoing book project and documentary film project called Predation, um, that I'm currently working on both of those. So. Meat is titillating, even when we're faking it. Consider the commercial for the plant-based Impossible Whopper, sorry, the Impossible Whopper at Burger King. A blonde man with a cowboy hat and handlebar mustache bites into a juicy burger wrapped in paper, declaring it's the classic Whopper, and looks into the camera and says, you can't imitate beef, it just tastes better. Another man in a tall cowboy hat and button-up shirt uh, learns that they've been fooled that it's the impossible whopper and declares, I'm a damn fool. Products like these are possible because of vegan technologies, including fat extrusion, mimicking animal fat, therefore enabling fat texture or marbling, prolamin, which is using proteins that enable plant-based cheese to melt, but bubble, and stretch, like dairy cheese as well as AI tech that analyzes the properties of edible plants in order to create vegan replications of animal products. These have expanded the multi-billion dollar vegan foods market. Barclays analysts predict that the plant-based meat market could be worth $140 billion by the end of this decade. That's 10% of the current $1.4 trillion meat industry. All the, and by meat there, I mean animal-based meats. Although the large majority of consumers who buy plant-based meats also purchase conventional animal-based meats, and many are affluent white consumers, these vegan options are staples among many black and lower-income vegan and vegetarian communities as well. 
For these meats to become so prolific required an influx of big tech cash. Impossible Meat, the company behind the Impossible Burger, was founded in 2011 and is backed by Microsoft founder Bill Gates. Eating more plants and less animals is a good thing. Here's a small sample of what we know. The consequences of the meat, dairy, and wildlife industries and the ongoing destruction of habitats are devastating. These industries are highly dependent on fossil fuels, greatly increasing emissions of the greenhouse gas CO2, and the animals themselves produce huge quantities of methane, another greenhouse gas. About one-sixth of the human population does not have adequate access to clean drinking water, yet in the U.S. alone, animal agriculture accounts for nearly half of all fresh water use every year. On a massive scale, land is cleared to grow grain to feed the animals that humans will later eat. The widespread destruction and invasion of non-human habitats, non-human animal habitats, increases the likelihood of future pandemics. It's likely that the wildlife industry was where the COVID-19 pandemic started. And up to 75% of new or emerging diseases are zoonotic. That is, they start with non-human animals. COVID-19 especially ravages communities with higher rates of pre-existing chronic conditions and plant-based foods, yes, even those processed vegan meats, are associated with lowering the risk of developing these chronic conditions. We know that the current planetary crisis and pandemic disproportionately harm not only those with underlying health problems and disabilities, but also children, older populations, ethnic and racial minorities, poor communities, and women. So the consequences of eating animals are devastating for humanity. Consider their implications for non-human animals themselves. Each animal slaughtered and butchered is a living being with their own personality and very much capable of physical and psychological suffering. Yet humans reduce them to pieces of meat, cage or otherwise contain them, commodify them, con condemn them to a life of stress, fear, and pain, profit off of them, and eat them. Now after that, I want to pause for a minute and, and, and explain that bef you know, before I go any further, um, I want to explain what I'm not seeing myself do in this work. I'm not arguing for a moralistic critique of all meat or dairy consumption or a puritanical argument for universal veganism. These typically focus on shaming individuals for their failures or inadequacies and typically betray various shades of white supremacy and ableism. I do not think uh, the burden of reorienting our relationship to non-human animals lies equally on everyone's shoulders. It does not lie on the shoulders of Native American communities, for example, who historically have relationships with non-human animals that often includes eating them, but that dramatically differ from those represented in the capitalist industries I critique. I'm not arguing against the dietary practices of those currently living without adequate access to plant-based foods, living in food deserts, or people who have, have to take non-vegan medications. Neither am I arguing that there is some natural order of progression, that animal liberation must precede human liberation, or vice versa. Rather, I'm using the recent proliferation of plant-based meat products to elicit reflection on the differences between mainstream, single-issue veganism, which upholds the dominant structures of the present, and radical forms of black veganism, which call forth new visions of the future. The latter reflects the work that is common across feminism, critical race theory, and critical animal studies. That is, it challenges the schema of the male, virile, white, heteronormative, human, carnivorous subject, a schema that capitalism depends on for its brutal and exploitative industries. Huge swaths of consumers in global cities all over the world spend their money on plant-based meats. Hence the emergence of large corporations, indeed entire industries producing its commodities. Some consumers opt for the expensive vegan foods available, for example, at Whole Foods Market, where they can shop also shop for eco-friendly biodegradable paper plates. The multimillionaire entrepreneur and founder of Whole Foods Market, John Mackey, uses the phrase conscious capitalism, arguing that capitalism's Quote, heroic spirit is the key to creating a world in which all people live lives full of prosperity, love, and creativity, a world of compassion and freedom, end quote. Mackey, by the way, is a self-proclaimed 100% plant-based eater and also a libertarian who complains about the socialists who are taking over. 
Plant-based meats, however, are no longer confined to the domains of Whole Foods Market and white affluent consumers concerned about self-care and the environment. In fact, they're available in a wide variety of grocery stores and restaurants and a staple in many of the vegan and vegetarian diets of black people. And in the US, black people are almost three times more likely to be vegan and vegetarian than other Americans. And 8% of black Americans are vegan or vegetarian compared to just 3% of the general population. Black vegan influencer Tabitha Brown just launched her third line, a vegan food line, at Target. Among Brown's favorites from the line are the plant-based barbecue burger and mango basil sausages. She said in a press release for the launch, quote, my goal for this third collection is to deliver Tab-approved vegan food options that taste good and feel good for the soul. I want to encourage y'all to be more intentional with what you feed your body so you can go on and shine your way. Set your table, set your intentions, end quote. Her vegan food products extend the work of her recent cookbook, Cooking from the Spirit, Easy, Delicious, and Joyful Plant-Based Inspirations. Ambitious goals lie behind her work, making, making vegan foods accessible, non-intimidating, and life-affirming. The voices with which such plant-based meat advocates call forth a different future are muffled by consumerist models of health and ethics. Access here is about consumer choice, not critique of the structures preventing access to begin with. The prescriptions for vegan foods as modes of self-care often have little or nothing to do with societal transformation. Rather, they denote the requirements for more perfect, that is more productive, efficient, and conforming workers and consumers. Quote, it's all about your mood, says Tabitha Brown. You can set your intentions with your food. I want us to be intentional about being good to ourselves. And sometimes our food is a way we treat ourselves, but we need to be intentional with what we put in our bodies and mind. It starts with us. I want to encourage everyone to be intentional about where, how we're treating ourselves, end quote. This emphasis on individual human perfection through consumer practices stands in place of addressing the social and environmental, sorry, my Wi-Fi thing popped up, the social and environmental stressors related to race, ethnicity, gender, sex, disability, and class that contribute to adversity and disadvantage and make for very different experiences of what it means to be human, much less a perfect human or a, perfect, a, a human who takes care of or um, treats themselves. Donna Haraway, Carol Adams, Angela Davis, and many other scholars working at the intersections of critical race, feminist, and animal studies have grappled with questions of what constitutes default forms of humanness, how these are upheld and by whom. They il illustrate that cultural and social normativity is the basis for exclusion from the category of human, thus fostering a deeper understanding of how certain subjects are understood as disposable, replaceable, or unworthy of care and how they are denied access to basic rights and face exploitation and commodification. Much of their work suggests that we cannot do animal or environmental ethics without social ethics. Flourishing ecologies must include justice within human communities, and just human communities must include non-human animals as moral subjects. Carol Adams, for example, explains how the sexual politics of meat is at work when we animalize women and sexualize and feminize animals, and in the assumption that men need and have a right to meat as they have a right to women's bodies as pieces of meat, therefore normalizing the predatory consumption of women and animal bodies. She explains the ways patriarchy is synonymous with exploitation, and there's no more accepted form of exploitation than that of animals and the environment. Argues argues that meat uh, Adams argues that meat is a symbol of, uh, of for what is not seen but is there, patriarchal control of animals, and by extension, women and the environment. Angela Davis demands that we address patriarchal control of women and the dominance of white supremacy as issues related to animal ethics, critiquing the food industry, for example, when she argues, quote, sentient beings endure pain and torture as they are transformed into food for profit. Food that generates disease in humans whose poverty compels them to rely on McDonald's and KFC for nourishment, end quote. 
In Donna Haraway's work on interspecies relations, she provides a framework for humans to enter into relationships with non-human animals as subjects, as significant others with their own needs, and with whom they empathize with in their otherness, not just in the ways they are like this or that particular way of being human. In contrast to mainstream single-issue veganism, which is at best a single-issue advocacy movement and at worst celebrates products like plant-based meats merely for the ways they expand consumer choice, black vegan activism aligns with the multi-species thinking of Haraway, Adams, and Davis. Well-known black vegan activists include Afco, Salco, and A. Breeze Harper. For these scholar activists, veganism is not just a consumer choice, Rather, an, interse an intersectional, multi-species, decolonial, liberatory practice and social movement. The ends of veganism do not just include opting for plant-based meats in place of other consumer choices. It also includes a critique of the larger food system and industries made possible by colonialism, white supremacy, and capitalism. Furthermore, they seek to disrupt the neocolonial takeover by these same industries in the global south. Neoliberal free market policies in the last 40 years have exponentially expanded meat and dairy industries and pushed meat and dairy consumption throughout the world. As black vegan advocate Lisa Betty explains, quote, modern human slavery eludes many vegans that haplessly compare five centuries of chattel slavery experienced by black people in the Western Hemisphere to the current conditions and confinement of non-human animals in agricultural industries. In addition to exploitation of humans, plant-based agricultural industries um, that vegans rely on also destroy, displace, murder, and poison non-human animals on a massive scale daily. This occurs in the name of vegan capitalism, which increases market access for vegans and plant-based eaters while promoting, rather than disrupting, white supremacist speciesism. Informed by radical veganism, some organizations are emerging that deliver vegan and vegetarian meals to predominantly black inner city communities or hold events like black veg and vegan festivals created by and for black communities in order to raise awareness about the intersections of racial, health, food, and animal injustices. Plant-based meats are often featured on their menus, but for many, buying these products is not sufficient. Rather, plant-based menus must be wed to a larger anti-capitalist project that veers away from emphases on consumer choice, individual inadequacies, and moral purity. Black veganism acknowledges intersectionality and variability among humans, refusing to call forth a homogenous purit puritanical future or seamless body of knowledge or universal paradigm without contestation. And here I see their movement as avoiding the pitfalls of what Lisa Sedaris has critiqued in the scientific and deep history narratives. So in these black vegan visions of the future, um, there isn't this homogenous vision of the human versus the animal, but neither is there this vision of us that the homogenous vegan versus the non-vegan. Um, there are many ways of being human. These black vegans are non-compliant. They challenge social constructions, binaries, domination, and normalcy. They demand that we do more than buying impossible burgers and beyond sausages. They demand instead that we radically reorient our relationships to non-human animals, that we not only acknowledge animal suffering, but cease killing and eating them, and instead live among them as members of shared communities that we acknowledge how chronic disease and systemic racism are currently inextricable and that we not just produce plant-based foods, but also that we make them accessible to black communities and in public schools and hospitals, and that we ver provide for a variety way of ways of being vegan or anti-capitalist. Their efforts resist speciesism, white supremacy, and capitalism, imagine and enact forms of solidarity between communities that are all dispossessed by capitalism's death-dealing structures and provide insights into what a future could look like. So thanks, I'm gonna end there. And who's next? Jacob. So Jacob Boss is next. Thanks so much, Andrea. I'm just gonna need one moment to set up my slides.
thanks everyone for showing up for this 8.30 a.m. panel. We really appreciate it. This has been great. Oh my gosh, and we still have so much more to go. It's very exciting. Could you do a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, hi, while my computer is booting up, um, I'm Jacob Boss, and I'm a doctoral candidate at Indiana University, um, graduating in May. Yay. <laughs> And I work on uh, human enhancement, human augmentation, body modification, religion, and science. <laughs> hmm. Well. It's not letting me in. Oh, caps lock, thank you. That was fun. Okay. Okay, we're, we're good to go now. Thank you everyone for your patience. All right, so uh, let's see. My talk today is called Gods of Blood and Salt, Dante's Transhumanism Revisited. And I'm so excited how many connections have already emerged between what I want to talk about today and what we've already talked about. Because um, transhumanism is everywhere, and I want to explore the possibility that in the etymological source text for transhumanism, there are resources for discovering alternative streams to its current developmental trajectories. One of those developmental trajectories has a lot of intersections with what Sylvester Johnson was talking about yesterday with human engineering. That is the, the group that uh, AI ethicist Timnit Gebru calls eugenics and fascism with a Silicon Valley accent. And then there's the other trajectory, uh, well, and those folks, that Silicon Valley uh, gang, uh, they're so enamored of themselves, just uh, wondering at the products of their own mind, like Lisa Sedaris has detailed. The other trajectory would be the Christian uh, transhumanists, like the Mormon Transhumanist Association, the Christian Transhumanist Association, um, the folks who people like uh, John Bolesky and Ron Cole Turner have written about. And we've also got some experimental scholarship like Philip Butler's um, imaginative project around black transhumanism, as well as critics like Noreen Hertzfeld, Tracy Trothan, and Hava Troche Samuelson. But what I'm doing is I'm distinguishing developmental trajectories from critical projects. Um, uh, developmental trajectories from practitioner constituted. Uh, uh, yes, let me start over because I'm trying to make it clear here. We've got critical trajectories and then we have developmental trajectories that are practitioner constituted. There we go. Um, and so none of the existing sort of main strains encompass my research community, which is at the grassroots. In my dissertation research since 2017, I've been embedded with um, the grassroots biohacker movement. And these are folks who are trying to learn how their bodies work. This can involve behavioral, pharmaceutical, surgical interventions, anything that's about discovering the rules like a hacker of the body in order to then modify those systems. And my primary research community identifies generally as grinders then they're distinguished by their emphasis on the surgical and body modification side of things. The grassroots scene that the grinders are part of is typically extra institutional, low resourced, and composed of many peoples of many different intersecting marginalized identities. Widely distributed, who can only afford to congregate infrequently. In their own words, they're the queerest, poorest, and the worst at business in the scene. And further distinguishing them from other operators under that big transhuman umbrella is that the community generally regards technologies of immortality as dubious. Dubious in both aim and in origin. The grinder progenitor, left anonym, describes the movement as practical transhumanism, sharing an interest in exploring the merger of human and technology, but characterized by direct self and community experimentation and acceptance of the risks that that experimentation entails. All right, check this out. The origins of transhumanism, including practical transhumanism, are in Dante Alighieri's 14th century poem, The Divine Comedy, in which he gives us the word transhumanar, 
in the first canto of the Paradiso. The poet stands on the shores of the celestial realm, having traveled through hell and purgatory in the company of the Roman poet Virgil and been delivered into the hands of a new guide, his beloved Beatrice. What did he experience there that required the creation of new language? What efforts, energies, or resources were wielded to bring this new word into being? Uh, this is Giovanni di Paolo's um, 15th century illumination depicting the flaying of Marcius. Before Dante can wrestle the spirit of living experience into the material of language, he first requires this very special empowerment. He does this by invoking Apollo in his dread aspect as the flare of Marcius. O oh good Apollo, make me the vessel of your excellence. Enter into my breast. Within me breathe the very power you made manifest when you drew Marcius out from his limbs sheath. Having called Apollo's bloody blessing into him, he turns to Beatrice and is transformed. I set my eyes on her. In watching her, within me I was changed as Glaucus changed, tasting the herb that made him a companion of the other sea gods. What happened in that moment? Trasumanar, a verb going beyond the human. What was it like, like Glaucus? who ate the mysterious and potent herb that transformed him so that his body became at home in the sea and with the gods of the sea. In typical mystical tension between the unconveyable experience and the need to describe it anyway, Dante shares that what he experienced cannot be told in words, but empowered with Apollonian inspiration, he can declare that it is like the transformation of Glaucus. And Glaucus and Apollo are mythologically linked. Dante builds subtle webs of referential relationships and here intensifies the potency of his invocation of these mutually reinforcing deities of fleshy inspiration and transformation. In the third century Deipnosophistae of Athenaeus, it is recorded that Glaucus was Apollo's tutor in the ways of prophecy. Thus, the simile to Glaucus moves the sea god from the product of Apollo's inspiration to being also the source. Besides that, there are many sensual tales of Glaucus that are recalled in Athenaeus. How Glaucus and Dionysus contested for Ariadne, and Dionysus fled with her. When Glaucus caught up to them, Dionysus bound him hand and foot in grapevines. Another tale says that Glaucus was the architect of the Argo and piloted it for Jason on his quest for the Golden Fleece. And it is said that Glaucus had many lovers, among them both men and women. Of the famed ship Argo, which Gla with Glaucus at the helm, Dante says that it shocked Neptune, god of the oceans, as it sailed over his head. This technological marvel that can catch even God by surprise. And there's so much here, there's just so much richness, so many gods and adventures in their viscerality, in their fleshy adventures. Surely this must be a moment of great consequence and inspiration for transhumanism. Fast forward 700 years and transhumanar is, has morphed from verb to adjective and abstract noun. And it's everywhere, but it's become something often very horrible. Incarnate as the notion that technology can be used to go beyond the human condition, transhumanism is an adaptable and renewable philosophical power source, but a deeply tainted one. Figured as the technological conquest of biology where Darwin at last gives way to Lamarck, it's churning, this transhumanism is churning out of Oxford offices where disgraced eugenicist and racist Nick Bostrom and his ilk in the long-termism movement promise the arrival of AI gods. It infests Silicon Valley C-suites where rent-seeking executives want to live forever and child trafficker Jeffrey Epstein fantasized about human breeding ranches. It's a boogeyman for seminarians. My inbox pings every day with right-wing media updates about how transhumanism will destroy humanity. Living bobblehead Charlie Kirk has claimed, quote, the trans agenda is being used to condition people to merge with machines and abandon their humanity. If you can stop being a man, you can stop being a human being. The trans trans subreddit, that's the transgender transhumanist subreddit response was, don't threaten me with a good time. 
this is a, an excellent venue for thinking about grinding as this alternate evolutionary trajectory of transhumanism. It leans toward aspirational and visionary thinking. It incorporates discussion of available body modification practices and resources. Ada Powers, who I met at a grinder event in Pittsburgh here, makes the point that the division between the philosophical and corporate technocrats reinventing eugenics and the grassroots body transformation scene is also a profound division in imaginative capacities. I'll let you get that photograph. Today, grassroots transhumanists are cutting and peeling their flesh to merge with technologies in acts that echo Apollo's flaying of Marcius and exhibit in their flaying that terrible creativity that Dante called upon for aid. Although the heavens are filled with great light and purity, refined and glorious, the powers that Dante summons to allow him to convey his experience are meaty, blood-drenched, horrifying in their potency. When Apollo kills Marcius, he flays the satyr, bursting his human-animal body apart, graphic, torturous, and terrible. But it's only that power, only through that power, with which Dante can have the hope to communicate this transformation. I'm going to, there we go, I'm going to die a nasty, gritty, meat, meat human, so you might as well use what you've got to pass it on. I don't have any illusion that what I'm going to do is turn me into this amazing transhuman, said Left Anonym, as we talked blood and guts and wires over pancakes. Left is the progenitor of the grinder subtype of transhumanism, characterized by their punk, do-it-yourself, maker-scene aesthetics. Left was helping me to understand why it felt the need to distinguish what it does as practical transhumanism, distinct from the work of the immortalists and organizations like Humanity Plus, the U.S. Transhumanist Party, and the Lifeboat Foundation. I think that my project is a work of political theory, which is necessarily religious, because you don't get society without religion, you don't get politics without society, but the Greek mythology aspect here is to say that while you as a human have to turn to religious language, as Beth Singler writes about, you don't have to turn to the symbolism and narrative of white supremacy or of otherworldly or transcendent salvation or immortality. And it's really important that Left insists on a family relationship to transhumanism by calling it practical transhumanism because it provides an example of an alternate developmental path for technologists. It provides an off-ramp for those who are drawn into transhumanism and then become aware of its abuses and its false premises, as Susan Levine has detailed in uh, her book on the failures of transhumanism. And those folks then may search for alternatives. And in entanglements of transformative divine power and nature wet with blood and brine, herbaceous, animalistic, they may find what provides the earthly substance of that alternative narrative for a transhumanism that stands against the universalizing claims of technocrats and theologians who depict transhumanism as entirely otherworldly and refined. Like Glaucus, grinders use biotechnologies to transform themselves and their environment, exhibiting in that flaying that creativity that Dante called upon. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Let me disconnect for you here. Morning, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Hemingway. I am a data scientist uh, with the Association of Theological Schools and a research associate in HLab at Case Western Reserve University with Tim Beal at the end of the table. Um, so um, what I'd like to talk about today or explore together today, really, um, if we get this thing to, hang on. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yep. There we go. Um, mostly, I want, I want us to play around a little together today with generative AI, right? So um, just so you know where I sort of come from, uh, I started a business, and the business name is Machines as Partners. 
So my, my predisposition is that uh, we have the potential to learn from and with machines in ways that can disrupt our dispositions toward consumption and domestication, right? Um, there are lots of other problems with technology. There are lots of other things we need to address, but uh, I, I have experienced this, this chance with machines to learn to, to, to have some different dispositions in the world. So I wanted to kind of explore some of that today together. Uh, how many folks have played around with Dolly? Yeah, super rad if you haven't. It's, it's very interesting. Um, Dolly 2 is pretty new. Uh, so again, another open AI product. There are lots of image generation uh, platforms out there. Dolly's not the only one. Um, I'm just using it because it's usually the most familiar for folks. Um, but so let's just try an older version of, of Dolly, which so what Dolly does, it's an AI generative model that um, will take text input from us and then generate an image. Um, and um, so, which is kind of fun. So let's give it a prompt. Anybody wanna, what, what, do you, what do we want Dolly to draw? Menstruation? menstruation? Yes, okay. Um, let's give it a little more instruction than menstruation. Um, menstruation, over caffeinated? Nice. Over, caff, how, how do I spell that? Caffeinated, that? Yeah. Um, in, uh, as a pencil drawing, something like that, right? Okay. Let's just see. Now, as it runs, um, uh, let me just tell, say a little bit, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skip over some of this, but the way these uh, image generation models work now um, is called diffusion. Right, so basically what we do is we give it a whole bunch of images and some text and the model ruins the image. It destroys the image by adding noise iteratively over and over and over again, okay? And it sort of keeps track of that process as it ruins the image and then it goes the other direction and it rebuilds the image by trying to extract the noise, right? Um, so many folks have said, you know, we're not even sure why this works, right? We're not sure how it's able to generate images. So look at this. Um, <laughs> it, it just seems to have ignored menstruation, do you think? Yeah. What do you see? Say it. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So this is interesting. So we've got, we've got a lot of coffee cups and some vaginal forms in either the foam or some on the cups, right? It's kind of interesting, right? So, so um, all I wanted to point out here is, oh, okay, we've asked a machine to generate an image, right? And it's constructed this image. It's not going out and finding images that already exist. It's, it's making this on the fly based on the text we gave it, all right? What, what might we learn from this, right? What, what kind of encounter might this stir up in us? Do we get anxious? Do we feel like we need to figure out how it did this or why it did this? Do we, do we need to ex explain it, right? Explain how it did it. You know, I wonder, do we need to? So um, these diffusion models uh, some, make some folks uncomfortable, right? Along with many other AI models because we can't quite understand them in our current human epistemological schemes, right? And Sylvester pointed to some of this yesterday around like maybe we need alternative epistemologies, right? Or hybrid epistemologies or overlapping epistemologies. But so one um, author who actually wrote a really nice piece on explaining how Dolly works um, called these, uh, the images that come out of these generators, meaningless statistical mashups not evaluative at all, right? Uh, so uh, this just raises for me the question of like, so why meaningless, right? And it, in what ways are the, the things we generate also statistical mashups, right? And so what work are we trying to do when we, when we look at a machine, an algorithm, or anything else and call it meaningless, right? What's the work we're trying to do there, right? And, and why would we go towards something that's meaningless rather than, huh, this is different and I don't quite understand it. 
what might we learn from this, right? And so I think this has something to do with the unfamiliar and the unexplainable threatens us, right, in ways. And then we then lean toward a disposition towards domestication, right? If we can make these things more like us, then we feel okay, right? Think of all the cultural contexts in which we have done this throughout history, right? So um, uh, our friend Tim Beale at the end of the table uh, has, um, has a, a, a really recent book um, called When Time is Short. And part of what I love about Tim's book is he, he gives us this notion of the dominion delusion that has been stimulated um, by Western Christianity in some ways, right? And particularly Western Christian readings of biblical texts, right? And so um, I'm not going to read this quote. You can read it. But, but basically this dominion delusion is like, oh, we've built a, a cultural mindset around the reality, as Sylvester mentioned yesterday, of human exceptionalism. And based on that, we get to domesticate all the things. And in fact, that is the pinnacle of humanity is to domesticate all the things, right? And I would argue that domestication, and many of our panelists have already talked about this, is often uh, an act of reducing something that is different or scary or other or, or fantastic into a system that we already have, right? An epistemological system, a social system, you know, whatever. But, but so domestication, in my sense, is, is a reductive move, right? A, a reduction of something that is other into something that is sane, all right? Um, and, and Tim also asks us in When Time is Short and, and demonstrates that there are other ways in which religions, ancient, indigenous, and other religions, actually offer us resources to disrupt this disposition toward domestication as reduction, right? So here's one example uh, that I find of religion as a resource um, in, in other directions. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Emmanuel Levinas. Um, there are lots of problems with Levinas, that sort of thing. But, um, but just briefly, I wonder if the notion of religion as the encounter with an other or the encounter of same and other in a relationship that is irreducible to a whole or irreducible to some kind of, you know, amalgamation of a same, right? If that is a notion of religion, maybe then religion offers us a resource toward a future where we can encounter other things, animals, the earth, different people, other cultures, extraterrestrial life, machines, encounter in ways where our primary disposition isn't to reduce that thing into our already existing frameworks, right? So what if that is a notion of religion, right? And then, so I then take that to say, okay, maybe the notion of religion as this irreducible encounter, which Levinas terms as the face-to-face -face encounter, right? What if that notion of face could help us re reimagine our notion of interface, which is becoming ubiquitous, right? Interface is, is now a thing we talk about all the time, right? Um, it, it, you know, didn't originate in the technical sphere, but it's very common when we talk about our relationship with machines. What if this notion of face as the irreducible could, could inform our um, enactment of interface, particularly in this case with machines, in ways that don't disposition us toward domestication, but open us to encounters with difference, um, and imagining new futures, right? So what if our notion of interface could change? Okay, so um, one uh, next example. So, and again, Sylvester mentioned this yesterday. So initially we looked at um, Dolly, which is uh, an image generator, right? Um, we also now are hearing all about these, these large language models. Um, Chat GPT is the one that Sylvester mentioned yesterday. Um, I wonder, again, in our encounter with these language models, and, and part, part of why I want to end with language is, oftentimes we think language is this fundamental human thing, right? <clears throat> I was even going to ask yesterday, Sylvester, when we were talking about Penny, right, was the person working with the, the gorilla, right? So 
Penny taught the gorilla, sorry, Penny taught the gorilla science, some form of sign language or a, a language that we think is, is somewhat human, right? I wonder if we ask Penny, Penny, were you learning gorilla? Was there any impulse to try to learn gorilla? Whatever we would call that, right? Or, or no, right? Or are we actually just go in the other direction? So I think the same in terms of language models. How much are we trying to domesticate our language models, these, these technologies, these machines, to sound like us? And is that really the best way for us to go forward with these technologies, is to make them more and more like us, or is there an alternative? Um, and that's really the question I'm going to leave us with. But I just want to—I just wanted to point out, we did some experimentation with older versions of the model that's underneath ChatGPT. Uh, a team of ours did, um, and we asked it, "What is happiness?" And, uh, and and you can see the response here. It, for some reason, decides that happiness is attached to spouses. Huh. Okay. Um, that's got some problems. Right? And then, uh, I, I didn't include the rest of this, but then it starts repeating itself over and over again, right? And so, our, again, our, our, my instinct, I'll just confess, is, oh, we've got to fix that, right? That's, that's broken. It doesn't sound like me. So let's fix it, right? And there's lots of ways to fix it. Some would be like, well, I mean, there's lots of people who have happiness without a spouse. What, what's going on there, right? What's the data set like, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so there were lots of problems with these early models. And so w basically the, the, the impulse was we've got to make them sound more like us. So we've done that, right? There's another tool, um, and uh, just in the interest of time, I won't, we won't demo these, but um, there's another tool you can use called InfraKit, um, which uses an older uh, version of um, GPT. Um, to do generation. It's fun to play with. Just go to InfraKit online. Um, you'll see that it, it's not, it, it does give you responses that seem coherent, but they're jumpy and they're a little strange and they're not nearly as fluid as what we now see in uh, ChatGPT, right? Uh, I don't know if that's big enough for you to see, but I asked ChatGPT, what if the human species has a finite future? And it gave a really nice paragraph, right? It sounds, you know, just like one of us might sound, right? And, and I guess my question is, and, and maybe uh, my question for us is, are we domesticating machines? And if so, is that our way forward in terms of our relating with technologies? And maybe we're not. I mean, and maybe that is the best way to go. But I wonder if encountering machines and the ways in which they're different, right, and particularly ways in which machines think, right, or back to Sylvester's talk yesterday, do machines know? There's lots of conversation around this, right? Well, what do we mean? Do they know like us? Or might they know in other ways that might teach us to have alternative futures in some way? So I guess that's our, my question for us is, are we domesticating machines? And if so, is that what we want to be doing? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, being with us and um, looking forward to some conversation. Um, with you all. Uh, this has just been great and I sort of am tempted to just say I lend the balance of my time starting now to talking about these four. Um, I'm Tim Beal. I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University. Michael and I uh, work on something called HLAB which is about experimenting with new and emerging computational tools and methods in order to do this kind of disruptive kind of perverse uh, computational work with machines um, and I also work with Andrea and Michael and Sylvester and a few others on a project funded by the Henry Luce Foundation um, called Finite Futures, Imagining Alternative Ways Forward in the Anthropocene. So all of this is just um, really uh, generative for me and exciting. Um, I think what I'm going to do is just 
fair, hopefully fairly briefly summarize what I had in mind to, to share with you all today and say that it's a summary of a chapter that I um, wrote and just published in a second edition of a book I did called uh, Religion and Its Monsters. The chapter is called God's Monsters and Machines. And I, if you want to email me, if you want to actually read that, uh, email me and I'll send you um, send that that to you so you can have a closer look. But what I um, imagine talking about with you all today, which I think is it, it, it connects in and, and is adjacent to a lot of what we've talked about so far, is around this um, this ambivalence uh, this ambivalent kind of mix of fascination and fear with regard to uh, creating in our own image. Um, and so I would start with how in the modern West, at least since Descartes' uh, uh, Discourse on Method in, in 1637, uh, we have often defined human over against two other kinds of creatures, animals and machines. Animals and machines are over here, and, and the human is over here. The, the I that therefore I am, the ego that ergo sum, is defined um, by the fact that I think, cogito, and animals and machines don't, right? Um, and in fact, very, Descartes' argument is very much about that, that we're linguistic in a way that animals and machines um, can't be. They can't think, they can't say what they think and they can't think what they say. Animals and machines can't, according to Descartes. Um, and and, and uh, Descartes talks about animals as essentially automata, um, machines that are made by the hands of God. So they're better machines than the ones we humans can make, but they're essentially the same, categorically the same, over against the human. So our nearness to an, identi an identification with God is uh, set um, over against and distinct from um, and exceptional to uh, animals and machines. The animals and machines are kind of the paired other uh, over against which uh, human is defined. And of course this unfolds then in terms of human as white, cis male, European, Christian and so on. And so lots of, of, of other humans get identified with animals and machines, just as, as you were talking about, Andrea. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of uh, setup. And, and, and yet what I, what I see is this kind of deep insecurity uh, in this core tenet of human godlikeness that, that we find at least since D Descartes, like the, the creator God in, in the early chapters of Genesis who creates humans in our image, as God puts it, and then freaks out because in Genesis 3, they have become as one of us and therefore banishes them from Eden and later destroys the Tower of Babel for the same reason. Uh, we too, we as creator gods, creating in our image and, and, and always being sort of fascinated with our power to do that, but then also we freak out when they, the machines become as one of us, um, get too close to us, identify too much. And so we have these nightmare fantasy stories from Frankenstein to Blade Runner to Westworld and so on. They give expression to this, this horror when our creature becomes as one of us and suddenly crosses that line and becomes in some sense monstrous. And I think that in, so, in many ways AI the sort of cultural understanding of AI today is just such a kind of monstrous machine of our own making. And our anxieties about it reflect this, this deep seated, these deep seated religious fears and fascinations about the unstable line between creature and creator. Look, they have become as one of us. Um, you just, 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 you know, read the news about Dolly and Chat GPT, and we can see this everywhere. Like the anxious creator God in Genesis, we wish to make our machinic creature in our image after our likeness. Yet we also worry if and when it is become as one of us, rendering us not so exceptional after all. So there's all of that dynamic of fear and fascination, and I think there's something deeply religious about this ambivalent um, 
uh, dynamic and interface we have with, with mach machines as they become as one of us. But I think at the same time, and I feel like I sound sort of old school Marxist here, these are kind of mystifications um, of AI and the industry of global computation that, that drives it and in many ways this kind of mystification of AI distracts us from the planetary costs. Um, I'm thinking about Kate Crawford's book, Atlas of AI, which I strongly recommend, where she's arguing that planetary comp computation, it's really like five or six companies, large corporations, um, that it is a continuation and even an escalation of uh, the extraction of minerals, of land, of labor, and of life that uh, is drilling and driving us to an early extinction. Um, we're familiar with AI's dependencies on the extraction and quantification of data from human bodies and human behaviors from speech to shopping habits to eye movements to heart rates and so on. Uh, Bernard Stiegler, historian of a philosopher of technology, argues that AI is the latest chapter or phase in the uh, capitalist history of what he calls and I'm going to mess this up, exosomatization. So uh, drawing out from the body, I guess, something like that. That is to say, extracting somatic, uh, organically embodied knowledge that has evolved over many millions of years into what he calls organological forms. That's what, that's what AI would be, an organological form that is, uh, has extracted uh, organic knowledge from, from bodies. Uh, I think that what Kate Crawford and others are showing is that AI is not only exosomatization of, 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 of organic bodily knowledge, but it is also what we might call uh, exogeologization. That is to say, extraction of the Earth's complex systems, which also have evolved over billions of years. And Kate Crawford's point, I think, reinforces Stiegler's argument that AIs drive toward uh, cybernetic exo, exo, exosomatization um, is, uh, is uh, generating what he calls the industri uh, something he calls industrial artificial stupidity that destroys attention, norm normalizes thoughtlessness. I think this is part of what you were just talking about, Michael. Uh, homogenizes social complexity and reduces domesticates local interactions to global totalizing systems. And so the overall effect of all of this is the acceleration of entropy in our complex ecological and social webs of life. So that's the kind of gist of, of, of what I would argue in longer form. Uh, I think that our fascinations and fears, our religious fascinations and fears, I would argue, about our godlike powers to create uh, in, in our image, AI and other examples are, are, are part of that, um, that process that Stiegler and Crawford are talking about and that they contribute to and distract us from the anthropocentric bed that we have made for ourselves. And, and the machines and the animals are always there trying to, trying to help us see that right, if we would only let them. And so for me, I, I feel like this panel is really all about interruption and rupture and what can be created and opened up in the space of the rupture, of the interruption, at least momentarily, to think not only about before it's too late urgent calls to action, but also to think about what if it's already too late? And Sylvester, I don't think this is incompatible with what you were talking about yesterday. And to, to maybe create spaces to grieve, to, to create spaces where we can detach uh, hope from perpetuity, um, think about collapsing well, stuff like that. Uh, and, and that opens up different voices for me um, that are about how we organize and how we be community together and how we imagine alternative futures and Amber I'm so it was such a great paper on Octavia Butler and I really I, I, I would keep rereading that that novel and Earthseed as almost a kind of scripture for thinking about this all that you touch you change all that changes all the oh, how does it go all that changes changes you um, changes God 
Uh, and, 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 you know, Octavia Butler has a pretty low anthropology. She doesn't have a lot of uh, hope and faith um, uh, for humankind, but it's, it's about working within broken systems uh, in transformative ways, and I think there's something to be thinking about there in terms of a powerful voice, and from her I started to discover Adrienne Marie Brown, whose book Emergent Strategies um, really is inspired by, by especially, I think, Earthseed and, and Parable of the Sower, but other work from uh, Octo Octavia Butler, uh, this notion of a science fictional imagination that we need to cultivate. Um, and then from there, uh, uh, I'm also thinking a lot about the work of uh, Bio Akomalafe and his idea of uh, fugitivity and sanctuary that, that the Anthropocene has announced in some way and created this new state for us, which is the state of fugitivity, of being on the run, of being unhomed, of being unsettled, both literally and figuratively, unsettled and unhomed from this narrative of progress that we have believed in for so long, unhomed and, and, and unsettled and on the run from this idea of the human who, that's over in some way, that's, it, whose story is, 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 is um, you know, announced as over, uh, proclaimed as over by the, by the Anthropocene. And so I thought I would end with a little quote from Bio. I'm a bit of a fanboy these days about, about Bio, but um, uh, it fits with a lot of what I've, what I've heard today. He says, the times are urgent. Let us slow down. He says that three times. I'm not talking about taking a vacation or yoga in the office. I'm talking about slowing down to listen, to notice the other temporalities that are cross-intersecting or intersecting the temporality of progress, of moving forward. They're blocking our path, and the place where the obstacle is is where the treasure is. So let us sit around the treasure. Let us sit around the obstacle. Let us treat the rupture in the ground as a classroom, and maybe by being there, we might become different. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about speculative religion. Is that your term or one that you're cultivating from elsewhere? Thanks. disrupting um, um, common hell beliefs and notions about religion, about the human, about time and space, right? So, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Octavia Butler, or 
Oh, spec. Uh, John Balecki. Yeah, John Balecki. But Balecki, right? Is that his name? Balecki. John Balecki. Something like that. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question for um, Michael and Tim. Uh, in thinking about domestication of machines, when does m domestication become a bad thing? Because we domesticate, you know, humans are domesticated. We, I live with multiple animals, including two human boys and a doggy boy animal. And I've domesticated all of them so that none of them pee on the floor. Uh, and this creates a home in which we can cohabitate. Uh, and, you, and so, uh, is domestication necessarily always a bad thing, uh, or can it be a part of community setting rules, boundaries? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a, such a helpful question. Thanks, Andrea. I think, I don't know, I think that's part of the conversation we ought to have around um, what forces are at work in a particular domesticating process, right? So I, I think my gut reaction would be insofar as domestication isn't uh, a reduction of all of the animals that you live with into basically being like you, um, then I think that's a negotiation of community um, that, is, that is helping us build a society where we can live together. I'm not sure I would call that domestication, I would call that something more like, um, you know, negotiating community, right? Uh, and we need rules. I'm not saying we don't need rules. We don't need, you know, agreed upon things, and we're going to disagree. And so there's an agonism that needs to be at work yeah, as we continue to negotiate community. But um, I, I, so that's where I think I would draw the line is, are you asking all of those other entities in your space to become like you, uh, and be reduced into your system of knowing, of, of acting, et cetera, et cetera. Insofar as you're not doing that, it feels to me like it's more of a negotiation. Yeah, uh, something like what Donna Haraway talks about in terms of living with significant others in their otherness. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's to get, and this is where I think Levinasian proximity helps because it's an approach, right, and it's an encounter, right, that isn't, that never actually resolves into a oneness. Right, so it's together in difference, right? Rather than this kind of like I, I have to make that thing like me and reduce it in order for me to be able to live near it. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. I'd like to follow up on that uh, train of thought for a second. I liked your idea of the domestication. Uh, as AI gets smarter and smarter and learns more and more from us. Perhaps what happens if AI finds that domestication might be a survival mechanism for it and tries to domesticate us? Would we even know? In, their, in the term of domestication relative to a machine versus our definition. Yeah, uh, yeah um, that's a really interesting uh, consideration, yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, would we even know? Like, uh, I don't know if we would, you know? Um, I think, you know, that, that actually for me it raises a question of how are we being domesticated otherwise already, right? As Andrea, you raised, like we're being domesticated too. So in what, f what forces are domesticating us right now? And are we aware of those, right? And, and in that case, could we learn from that in terms of how we continue to negotiate our relationship with the others that we encounter, machines being one of them. Um, I, I, you know, I think the, the initial part of your question around as AI gets smarter, uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't know that AI is getting smarter. Uh, I think we're asking AI to be more like us, right? And, and so if AI is gonna get smarter, uh, mm -hmm. I wonder, maybe it would say, yeah, as a survival mechanism, I'm going to try to make humans more like me, right, as a machine, maybe, um, and we'll have to, f we'll have to see, uh, but I, I do think, again, I would say, I'm not sure AI is getting smarter. I think we say it's getting smarter because it's starting to look more like us. I, I mean, even in the language of artificial, right, 
It was defined artificial intelligence because we wanted to reproduce human intelligence through machines, right? So uh, I, I actually think in so far as we continue to go that route, we're just going to make it dumber because, because then we can control it. Um, yeah. I would agree with, I would agree, um, with that, and I, I wonder if that anxiety we have about it suddenly, this kind of animistic fantasy, right, of coming to life, um, if, if, uh, if that's actually a symptom of our own uh, repressed low view of ourselves, because what we're imagining it doing is what we do all the time, right? Um, so it's a kind of a mirror again. I want to um, first apologize. I'm supposed to be the moderator for the panel, and I was late this morning. I apologize. You're supposed to be domesticating us. Exactly. Um, also, we're at time. And also, I'm going to use a little bit of privilege because I do have the mic. Um, I want to question this us and this we. What's getting, like, AI, we say, like, we're getting, AI is getting smart. What is, who's the we? It's not my grandfather who was a farmer. Like, what is the model? for AI is getting smarter? Like, what? I just want to ask that. Yeah, and the fear is that AI is getting smarter really means that AI is looking more like a cisgender white man. Yeah. And, um, and that is scary because that just perpetuates then further white male dominance. Yeah, I think about um, Ruha Benjamin's um, uh, text, Race After Technology. Um, is, is that the title of it? Uh, or The New Jim Code? The New Jim Code, yes. Um, where she argues that, um, and you all can probably speak way better than me, but because I'm not in, in AI, right? But uh, she argues essentially that um, computer programs and AI are coded, as you say, Andrea, with a with a white male um, code or yeah, code for lack of better words, right now. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and by the way, this is the problem with single issue white veganism is that it splits humanity into vegans and non-vegans. And who is a real vegan? That vegan starts to look really white, affluent, privileged, mm -hmm. and that becomes the better human. Uh, I would just add to that. I, I think so. Philip Butler, um, Jacob mentioned Philip Butler. He's doing some really interesting work on developing um, non-universalizing language models um, that are explicitly black, right? Mm -hmm. And so trying to say, like, let's knock this off, trying to find a universal, right? And in fact, maybe that's part of the problem is yeah. large language models. Yeah. Maybe what we need is a whole bunch more local language models, yeah. right, that, that can actually handle um, non-universalizing, yeah. right? Something like what that. is a universal? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, this was a great panel at least all the ones that I heard. <laughs> I appreciate it. We're at the end of our time, so thank you.